like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Good morning, my friends. Welcome to the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit, where we join together in this fellowship of silence, this fellowship of the presence of the Lord, this fellowship that brings us together, all of one accord, all of one mind, all of one heart. This is our tradition, inspired by the prophet Hosea, who says, take your words to Yahweh. We take our words to the silence. In our bulletins, there is an invocation that will say three times together, softer and softer. And then we'll sit in the silence, the sweet presence of the Lord, for four or five minutes to allow the revelation of this truth to permeate our being. So together, there is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence, one power. And we live, we move, we breathe within this presence, this power, this underlying presence of harmony, of peace, of love. This presence is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us, seek ye first this kingdom of heaven. And we honor this as we silently sit in humble adoration of the vastness of this presence, the depth, the silence of this presence, the peace of this presence. We give thanks for this opportunity, this possibility of being within this presence. Now let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's a, a true story dating back to the 1920s of a, uh, a, law, a lawsuit, a law case. It involved a man who'd been walking along a pier when suddenly he trips over a rope and falls into the, the ocean. And the water is cold and swirling and moving. And it's a beautiful sunny day and his friends who are several hundred yards away can hear him shouting, help, help, I can't swim. And they're too far away. But 15 feet away, 15 feet away is a man sunbathing a young man who happens to be an excellent swimmer. And he ignores, sort of with complete indifference, ignores the calls of the drowning man. And uh, the man drowns. And his friends and his family are so shocked and so offended by this man's indifference, this sunbather's indifference, that they sue him. They say he had a duty to save that man. He, he had the ability, he had the means, and he could have. 
And the court sort of reluctantly said, you know, we hate to say this, but he has no obligation, no duty to jump in that water and save him. So I don't know what was going on in that man's mind. You know, they did not try to save a, a drowning man. You know, maybe he didn't care. Maybe he was drunk. Maybe he, he was afraid or maybe he just panicked and just froze in indecision and not knowing what to do. But I'm, I'm sure he always regretted not saving that man. These past several weeks, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven as, as being a state of consciousness. And I'd say just as, in a sense, we're under no legal obligation to save a drowning man, and in a certain sense, people are under no legal obligation to seek the kingdom of heaven. But if we don't, what happens to our lives? And I wonder what happened to the life of that young man who did nothing. You know, at the very least, severe public humiliation. And uh, I would also guess years of regret that he could have but didn't. So Jesus tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, I, uh, I went to a lecture last week on campus. Uh, for, uh, Professor Fred Travis was speaking about brain waves in higher states of consciousness. It was, he showed one very interesting study. He was comparing the brain waves, and this is both how much silence is in alpha and theta waves a person is experiencing, and talking about how much integration there were between the different parts of the brain, the coherence. And he put up this chart on the screen. It said, you know, people have been practicing transcendental meditation for just a month or so, or like a non-meditator. He has a way of mapping, measuring how much coherence and, and, and amplitude of these, of these brain waves there is. Very short bar. People have been meditating eight years, had a higher bar, more integration, more silence. People who are experiencing higher states of consciousness had a very high bar. Third one, you all have seen charts like this. And then he did something very interesting. He said, he said I was doing a, a collaborative study with someone, I think it was in Norway, it might have been Denmark, who was really well connected over there. And he pulled together 20 of the top managers in Norway, men in their own industries who had been rec you know, recognized by public awards for outstanding management. And obviously they're very successful, very prosperous, this sort of thing. And they measured their brain waves. And they showed up as being between the eight-year meditators and the people experiencing higher states of consciousness. Okay? And then he measured, I guess, another batch of 20 athletes who, as I understood it, were world-class athletes and had scored in the top 10% of their competitions over the last three years. So again, very successful in their own field. And they showed up right about the same place, actually a little bit higher, just a touch higher, than these very successful managers. And I started to think, I thought, boy, this is really what Jesus is saying. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. The more silence we have in our lives, the more presence we experience, the more successful we are. All these things are added unto us. And it just makes common sense, you know, if, if we've got... a ton of mental static going on, thoughts and, and feelings that we can't control, all this sort of thing, it means we can't focus on our jobs and our world and our life. So I want to talk today about a story in the Bible, the, the story of the loaves and fishes, of, of interest for a number of reasons. But one is, it's the only miracle story, other than the resurrection, that's found in all four Gospels. You know, most of the Gospel of John doesn't include the, the miracles of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, one of the things I, I love bringing out about this particular story is that Charles Fillmore, you know, the, the co-founder of the Unity Church, which is sort of our, our heritage here, is a true Christian mystic, but he loved to point out how practical Jesus was, that the teachings of Christianity are designed to improve our lives in the world, not just to find some heaven and the afterlife. In fact, he called unity 
a school of practical Christianity. And the, one of the principles in unity is, so they, they call it the principle of the loaves and fishes. They say it's fine to try and teach the higher truths, the deep meditation techniques and all this sort of thing. But first, feed them loaves and fishes. And that's why in unity, there's always been this strong emphasis both on healing and on prosperity. Just, uh, you know, the whole practical sides of life. So we're going to talk a little bit about food today, because obviously loaves and fishes are food. And I, I would have you all, you know, think of the story of the loaves and fishes. We all know what it is. I'll read it to you in a little bit, but we all know the story. And Jesus, Jesus feeds the multitudes. And imagine, and this is sort of the, you know, the, the, the premise of the Bible being a vehicle to teach different things to different people who are in different circumstances. You know, depending on where you are in your life, the Bible has a message. So imagine trying to teach this gospel story, the loaves and fishes, where Jesus feeds the multitude. If you're in Ireland, let's say 1847, 1848, the middle of the Irish potato famine, you know, you read the story of Jesus feeding the multitudes, and they're all starving. And they don't know if they're going to be alive next year or not. And you're the preacher. You don't even know if you're going to be alive to preach this sermon the next year. You know, when I was, someone had, been, I, I was reading this, someone suggesting this to think of it this way. And I thought, boy. And I went and looked up the Irish famine in Wikipedia, you know, the online encyclopedia. And they say, you know, the Irish, they give the historical data. The Irish famine started, uh, I think it was 1845. Yeah, 1845 depending on the region, lasted until 1849 or 1852, caused by this potato blight that was killing the potato crop. They say a million people died, that another million left, and that and I couldn't, you know, this is in Wikipedia, so I find it hard to believe, but it's probably true. They say that Ireland has never recovered that population to this day. I can't figure that, but that's what they're saying. Anyway... Take another imagination, imaginary sermon you're giving. It's you're in a refugee camp on the uh, Sudan-Kenya border. You know, your Bible study group is made up of people who've, who've fled this genocidal war in Sudan, barely subsisting on UN food rations. A very angry young man says, God no longer does such miracles. He's going to join the rebels and fight back. What do you say? It's hard for us to sometimes comprehend what people experience when they don't have enough food. Our experience is too much food. The concern is losing weight, dieting. It's a very different... What do we do with this? But that's why we teach prosperity principles in addition to the esoteric truths. So let me read this... uh, I'll read the one in Mark, like I say, it's in all four Gospels. Then they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. This is on the Sea of Galilee. The people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all the cities, and got there ahead of them. In other words, they saw Jesus and the disciples taking a boat across the Sea of Galilee. It's about a ten-mile walk you know, from one side to the other. It's a beautiful sea. It's really a lake. It's really, really a beautiful, a beautiful place. But uh, so all these people walk around from all the cities, you all hear it just to go hear this, this master Jesus speak. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so they may go into the surrounding court countryside, and villages, and buy something themselves to to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Now, it's a very interesting translation here. The literal, the literal translation in that phrase is, you feed yourselves to them, which is very interesting. I mean, I'm sure Jesus is not uh, suggesting cannibalism or anything like that, but I think he's 
He's telling the disciples in the literal sense that, you know, it's time for you to start teaching also. Time for you to heal and pray like that. There's also, well, we'll, we'll get to it, but there's also this throughout, particularly the Old Testament and the Greek world, there's this numbering system of letters that scholars throughout history have, you know, taken the numerological significance. This is both in, in Greek and Judaism. You know, every, every letter has a number or has a symbol, and they, they put all these, they, they put this, it's, it's a very, very incredible science, and I, I can't really do it justice. But there's an argument in that sentence that this is about the higher states of consciousness. You, know, you feed yourselves to them. Anyway, the disciples are sort of baffled when he says, you feed it, to, you, you know, you will feed them. And, and they say, they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? So more or less saying, listen, uh, a denarii is one day's wages. They're saying, you know, this is eight months worth of someone working to feed this crowd. So, or should, we t- should we go find this money some- somewhere? Because I don't think they have it. There's a lot of money to be carrying around. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Every so often I'll throw in some of the traditional prosperity principles here. And one of them is, count your blessings. Look at your life, see what you have, and count it. Realize you have far more than you would ever expect. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And the principle here is set your affairs in divine order. Allow God to organize your life. Go through your closets, clean them out, your garage, clean them out. The things in your life that are not supporting your life mission, let them go. Even if you feel, oh, you know, but I... I I you know, need to do this for these people or these people want me to do this. If things are not flowing in your life, let go of those things. Allow someone else to fill that void and put your affairs in divine order. Miracles will just happen. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and he kept giving them to all the disciples to, to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. And the principle here is the power of blessing is unimaginable. No matter what you have, bless it. Watch the increase. No matter what is going on in your life, bless it. The minute you go and condemn it and say, oh, all I have is $100 in my bank account, oh, and condemning your bank account, what happens is you freeze it right there. Start blessing whatever you have, no matter how small, and you'll just watch it multiply. They ate, and all were satisfied. And they picked up twelve full baskets of the broken pieces, and also of the fish. There were five thousand men who ate the loaves. So there's a lot of symbolism in this story. First is, it's a reference towards the feeding of of the Hebrews in the wilderness. Just as Moses prayed to God and the manna appeared to feed the, 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 the Hebrews in the, in the wilderness for 40 years, so Jesus is, in the same way, feeding out there in this desolate wilderness. Secondly, the, the story relies heavenly on Second Kings, a story where Elijah miraculously feeds 100 men with just 20 small loaves of bread. You know, Elijah, there's a big, there's 100 men, and there's woman there also. They've got these 20, apparently, small loaves of bread. And uh, Elijah says, feed everyone with them. And the person says to him, what, I'm supposed to feed 100 with these 20 small loaves of bread? But they fed them, and they were, there was bread left over. What is happening, just sort of a, an understanding of, of the writing of the Gospels, is Jesus is being compared back to both Moses and Elijah and also to King David. You know, that the, the disciples, you know, the, these, the Gospels are written, let's say, 70 to 120 A.D., so they're 40 to 80 years later. So 
stories, understandings, and they, 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 they fill in to, to add credibility. I mean, I, I'll tell you a – maybe I shouldn't even say the story, but I'll do it anyway. But it, this happens in every spiritual path that I've seen, and I, I've, I've looked at a number of them, is that history gets rewritten. And it's not to say there's not truth in them. It's just that there's, you know, the disciples get really enthusiastic and want everyone to believe what they believe. It's a very natural process. The story I'm thinking of is, is one master from India, current master, who is a phenomenal master, has really no need of embellishment, <laughs> very, very, very famous. But uh, she's from Kerala, the southern province of India, where a third of the state of Kerala is communist. So she travels around the world to massive, massive crowds. You know, this is the Amachi who's hugged 27 million people just out of pure compassion, just to give them all the individual experience of love. Well, she goes to Russia one year, and very small crowds come. But what happens is, in their monthly magazine they put out, they tell the story of massive crowds coming to see her in Russia. Okay? And... Here is a, a guru who has no need of PR. You know, she, she's mobbed all the time. But the disciples, many of them who were communist, you know, some, someone went and asked Amanchi about this. And she says, oh, you know, my disciples here in Kerala would be so disappointed because Russia was a communist state at the time. They'd be so disappointed if <laughs> the communists didn't come to greet me. <laughs> so she says, it's, we just let it go. You know, but this is what disciples do is they portray their master in the most positive light. So these disciples, because at, at 80 AD, Jesus wasn't famous. You know, locally, here and there, certainly, you know, 5,000 people come to hear him. But, you know, worldwide fame, you, you would hardly say that. You know, that doesn't really come until 300, 400 AD. So they are comparing Jesus to Moses, comparing him to Elijah, and very specifically, comparing him to King David, you know, who is called the Messiah. In the Bible, King David is called the Messiah. King Cyrus is called the Messiah, you know, who returns the, all, you know, the, the temple to the Jews. He finances that. He returns all their beautiful golden artifacts, articles, utensils of, of, of worship. And King David's story is, at one point, you know, he's, for a while he's King Saul's great servant. And King Saul loves him until he's more popular than King Saul is. So David flees for his life. And he flees with a small band of, of warriors. He's sort of like a gorilla in hiding. Actually becomes a mercenary for one of the neighboring kings. But at one point when King Saul is chasing him, David's hungry. There's no, uh, no real way for him to eat. So he goes to a temple and says, Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you have. So... When you start off the story with five loaves of bread, it's a direct reference to King David. The final, final sort of reference here, or the final symbolism here, is out of the Last Supper. That is that there's always bread to break with Jesus. Always. Everyone is welcome. There's actually two stories of the feeding of the multitudes. One is of 5,000, one is of 4,000. And there's some scholars who will say, oh, goodness, this is just, you know, a, a duplicate story. They're just, you know, a second story and, and they're duplicating it. But the symbolism of the numbers is so strong that most other scholars say, no, there are really two, story, two separate and di distinct stories. So the, and we'll go more, some more into the this, this symbolism of the numbers. So, so some of the early interpreters of this Bible story, this is the loaves and fishes story, where Jesus took five loaves and fed the 5,000. They say the, the five loaves refer to the five books of the Torah. And the 12 loaves left after refer to the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, that, that after this, you know, there's even enough for the 12 tribes. After the teachings of Jesus, there's enough for the 12 tribes, or also could be referring to the 12 disciples, that they have the blessings of abundance for them to share with the rest of the world. 
the story of the 4,000. I say, numerologically, from the, the Jewish cosmology, there were four corners of the earth, and the 4,000 refers to all the Gentiles throughout the world. And there's seven loaves left over after that. And, of course, that gets compared to, you know, the seven uh, major cities that, that Paul went to and created churches. There's uh, seven, you know, of, uh, stands of the menorah or the, or the temple or the... Yeah, there's just... Oh, everybody knows. Everybody knows about sevens. <laughs> anyway, with all these stories, you know, we're, we are... We are here to imitate Christ. It is through this imitation of Christ that we walk through the open door that Jesus is. We walk through this open door into this kingdom of heaven. We cleave to the very presence of the Lord. And in that way, by this sort of modeling process, we grow closer and closer to the divine. But we all might say, what can I do? You know, I'm just one person. I can't feed the multitudes. You know, I, I would um, I'd tell you a story about Booker T. Washington, you know, the, the great scientist. In 1872, at the age of 16, he decides that he wants to go to college go to school. So he walks 500 miles to the Hampton Institute in Virginia and he presents himself to the head teacher. And Washington later recalls, he says, you know, having been so long without proper food, without a bath or without a change of clothing, you know, 500 miles, you're probably, you know, let's say at best 15 miles a day because he's, he's scrounging for food and doing, you know, I'll cut your wood for a meal. How he's trying to get... <laughs> trying to get there, he's got to be eating also, you know, you're talking, you're talking a month's travel. It's, it's, it's quite a, a statement of commitment. He's just one person, mind you. He says, I didn't make a very favorable impression, and I could see at once, and the headmaster was really a woman, he says, there were doubts in her mind about me. This is the interview process as to whether or not he's going to be accepted for being a student. Finally, she says to him, you know, he's very earnest and really... <laughs> She says to him, well, you know, the adjoining recitation room needs cleaning. Take the broom and go do it. And, you know, some people might take that as an insult, but he took that as an opportunity. He says, I went in there and I swept it four times. I, I, I dusted everything three times. I just, you know, the place was spick and span. And when she comes, to, and they go, then he goes to her, when she comes to investigate it, she can't find a speck of dust. She even takes her handkerchief and wipes it across the top of the door. It comes out perfectly clean. So she goes, well, I guess you'll do. <laughs> and, you know, he goes on to gift the world amazing things with all of his, his research. But he's 16 years old, and he can easily say, who am I to be able to do anything? And the lesson I take out of this is no matter what is in front of us, do it. Do it fastidiously. Do it perfectly. Do it with great attention. And in that process, more and more blessings will come in. More and more opportunities will come in. You know, we, we live in a culture here. There's, I'll tell you one thing you can do when you say, what can I do as one person? The, uh, the Wall Street Journal a while back wrote about one of the really booming industries in America. And it was the building of all these storage units that you now find in every town, everywhere. But what happens is we have so much stuff, we can't keep it in our homes, so we go rent a place to keep it in there. You know, we're overflowing with stuff. And we say, how much is enough? How much, is, how much do we need? My daughter, one of the great stories I love to tell about her is when she was 14, she went over to India to live for six months. Typical Western girl. She comes back, well, going over there isn't so typical, but when she, when she went over, she was. She comes back after six months of, of living in this ashram of, you know, very Spartan living, and she looks at her bedroom and she says, I can't believe how much junk I have. And immediately threw out half of it. 
Now, threw it out or gave it away. So I would say the first thing for all of us, both for our own prosperity and for the sake of something to do, is go home, clean out your garages, clean out your closets, bring it down to the bargain box. The food you haven't eaten for six months, you know, some canned chow mein that you're, you've got and you don't know, you know, give it to the food pantry. Give it to the Lord's cupboard. Clean it all out. You will be blessed. John D. Rockefeller, at the height of his career, was asked, once asked, you know, he was, he was the Bill Gates of his time. I think actually comparatively wealthier when you adjust the dollars for inflation. That's, you know, he was asked, how much is enough? And he says, just a little bit more. <laughs> just a little bit more. And that's, we think we're going to get fulfillment just as this little bit more when every one of us here, really, compared to the people throughout history, compared to 90% of the world, we live like kings, kings, queens. This world is not going to change by some government policy causing a change. The world is going to change from the bottom up when there's a shift in the very nature of the people. And then the government will shift to reflect that. So every time, every time we act kindly, the world has more kindness. Every time we're more compassionate, the world has more compassion. Every time we can go on all the positive virtues, every time we favor that, the world shifts to more love, to more kindness. Every time we donate, every time we do something that's encouraging to other people, every time we visit the sick, every time we feed the poor, it's drop by drop, just this like this development of consciousness we talked about last week. You know, this it's like this yeast in the flour, cell by cell, cell by cell, it grows, it develops. And in our own lives, every act of compassion builds this kingdom of heaven within us. And I'd like to end with one beautiful passage I found in Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heaven of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and above heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Let's close our eyes for a minute. And just take a breath. Relax our bodies. Sort of scan your body and feel any tension, any tightness, any sensations. And just feel love for them. Let them go. Bless them and praise them. In all things, praise God. And let's let our attention move into our hearts and feel the sweetness, the presence of this part of our body, the center of divine love. And from here, let us praise Him. Let us praise God. Let us praise God and love our neighbor. Praise God and love our neighbor. Breathe again into your hearts. This is the seed of love. And all love comes from God. 
in this little place in our heart springs forth this presence, this love. And let that place soften. Soften. And soften some more. If it's helpful, allow the image of the divine, the image of Jesus Christ, to enter your heart. And there we enthrone him. There we bow down before him. There we love him. And now let us allow this attention to move down through the body, through the torso, through the legs, and down to the very soles of the feet. That our feet might be kissing the earth in devotion to God, that we might be grounded. Here on the earth, we might work the works of God, the works of compassion, the works of love. And for this we say, thank you, God, and amen.